Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn some game theory. Today's topic is a generalized version of Battle of the Sexes. I cover these sorts of generalized games in Lesson 3.2 of Game Theory 101, the complete textbook. Check the video description for more information about that. Now, let's look at the game that we're going to be looking at today. I briefly talked about this in the last video, I previewed this, and now we're actually going to tackle it in, in this video. So we have a battle of the sexes game. Both players can either go to the ballet or go to the fight, and their payoffs are listed on the screen there. Now notice that these aren't precise numbers. It's not like it's zero, one, or two. Instead, it's A, B, or C. And up here, I've noted that A is greater than B is greater than C. This applies to both players, whether we're talking about player one's capital A, capital B, and capital C, or player two's lowercase a, lowercase b, and lowercase c. The reason that I have capitals for player one and lowercases for player two is I want to just signify the fact that these numbers don't have to be the same for both players. This big A could be four for player one, but two for player two. Two and and so forth. So these numbers could actually be different for our, for each player. The important feature, though, is that the ordering is the same for both players. So A is greater than B is greater than C. So if you're ever given a game that looks like this, how do you solve it? Well, you do it exactly the way you've done it before with actual numbers. You just have to think about it a little bit more uh, carefully because there's some extra logic in there when you're dealing with these variables as opposed to specific numbers. So it's still the case like in the, the regular Battle of the Sexes game, that we have two pure strategy Nash equilibria. Ballet, ballet is a pure strategy Nash equilibrium, and fight, fight is a pure strategy Nash equilibrium. Let's show this by looking for profitable deviations. So first, let's start off with the ballet, ballet equilibrium. Does player two have a profitable deviation here? The answer is no. If he sticks to his ballet strategy, assuming that player one is playing ballet, then she earns A, for playing ballet, if she switches over to fight, she earns C. But remember that A is greater than C, so this is not a profitable deviation for her. She's happy playing ballet because A is greater than C. Now what about for player two? Well, player two, if he maintains his ballet strategy, given that player two will be playing ballet, earns B for that. If he switches over to fight, he gets C instead. B is greater than C, right? B is greater than C. So player one doesn't have a profitable deviation. So ballet, ballet is mutually optimal. That means it's a pure strategy Nash equilibrium. Let's do the same thing over here for fight. So that covered ballet, ballet. Now let's check, uh, check and take care of uh, fight, fight here. So if player two is expecting player one to play fight, does she want to deviate from fighting? Again, the answer is no, because B is what she's earning from going to the fight. She would get C if she switched over to the ballet. B is greater than C. B is greater than C. So that means player two does not have a profitable deviation from fighting, given that player one is going to the fight as well. Now on player one's end, he earns A for going to the fight, and if he switched to going to the ballet, he would earn C instead. A is greater than C, so that means player one does not have a profitable deviation here because he's happier going to the fight than he is going to the ballet, and so that means fight, fight is mutually optimal, so that's a pure strategy Nash equilibrium. So we've covered the two pure strategy Nash equilibria here, but you should also remember that in the Battle of the Sexes game, there was a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. So we need to solve for the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium here check to see if there in fact is a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium there in fact will be by virtue of the fact that there was one when we had specific numbers that's going to imply that there's also going to be a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium here given the preference ordering of a is greater than b is greater than c so what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to run the mixed strategy algorithm for one of the players mixed strategies and I'll leave the second one for you to do uh, in the textbook in section 3.2 I actually cover a lot of these games and also show when you run the mixed strategy algorithm and something goes wrong, how that can happen and what it means. So the textbook is really good at covering this sort of problem. So if this video isn't enough for you, I, I do highly suggest you look through uh, section 3.2 and go through the examples there to get a better comprehension of what's going on. But let's cover the mixed strategy for player one. So we're going to solve for player one's mixed strategy here. We're running the mixed strategy algorithm just as we would before with a few slight quirks, which we'll get to in a moment, but at least at first, this is exactly what we would do normally. So we're still asking ourselves what the expected utility of left is for player two. We'll then ask what the expected utility of right is for player two. We'll set those two expected utilities equal to each other, and we'll solve for player one's 
mixed strategy that leaves player two indifferent between her two peer strategies. So let's start off by asking ourselves what player two's expected utility is for left as a function of player one's mixed strategy sigma up. So some percentage of the time, player two gets A. That's when player one is playing up. And then the rest of the time, player two will get C. So player two's expected utility for playing left as a peer strategy is equal to the probability that player one plays up times this payoff A and the probability that player one plays down, which is one minus sigma up times C here. And so that's player one's, or rather player two's expected utility for left. Now we repeat this process for right. This is again, just like we would normally do when we're running the mixed strategy algorithm, nothing abnormal here so far. So now we're asking ourselves what player two's expected utility is for playing right as a function of the same mixed strategy sigma up from player one. So some percentage of the time, player two is getting C. The rest of the time, she's getting B. And so the expected utility of playing right as a peer strategy for player two is the probability that player one plays up times the, prob or times the payoff C plus the probability of player one playing down, which is one minus sigma up times the payoff B here. And to complete the mixed strategy, all we have to do is set those two expected utilities equal to each other and solve for sigma up. So remember, we have expected utility left uh, equal to the expected utility of right. The expected utility of left is what we got from two slides ago, which is just that right there. The expected utility for right is what we had from last slide. That's right there. We have three unknowns and three equations, which means we can solve for those unknowns. So we want to solve for sigma up here. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by setting this equal to this, which is that right there. So that's just from these two bullet points, just attaching them together. And now we need to work to solve for sigma up here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to work through all of these parentheses and multiply everything out. So uh, this is essentially just moving everything over and down, right? So this A goes in front. We're multiplying the C by one minus sigma up and doing that, and then doing the same thing here. Nothing abnormal there. And then what we have to do to solve for an unknown like this, when we have a bunch of numbers, remember that B is a number, C is a number, A is a number, they're just numbers. It's just that they're variable in a sense. So we can't add them together like we can normally do with numbers. But the way that you're gonna solve for an unknown like this is you're gonna group everything up on one side that has a sigma up in it. So we're gonna just gotta move all the sigma ups over to one side and move all of the things without sigma up over to the other side. So that looks like this. So what we're doing is we're moving this C over here. So that's gonna give us with a B minus C. Notice that all of the things that don't have a sigma up are now on this side. And then we're gonna subtract this C times sigma up from both sides. So that's gonna give us two C sigma ups because there's one over here and that's what's coming down here. And then we're adding this B times sigma up to both sides and so that's coming over here. And so now we have sigma up alone on one side and we have everything without sigma up on the other side. We can take out a sigma up from each of these figures. So that looks like this. So now if you multiply sigma up by a plus b minus 2c, that gets you what you had over here. And once it's out like this, we can then divide both sides by a plus b minus 2c, and that will leave us with this by itself, the sigma up, and we'll have solved for sigma up. Now, the one tricky thing about dividing numbers that aren't actual numbers like two or five is that when you have these sorts of variable numbers, these exogenously variable numbers, then the important thing to do is to make sure that this is not equal to zero. If this is equal to zero, then you can't divide by it, right? You can't divide by zero. So if a plus b minus two c is equal to zero, you can't divide it. So let's check to make sure we can divide by this. Notice that we can write a plus b minus 2c is just a plus b minus c minus c. Well, remember that a is greater than b and b is greater than c. So a is greater than c. So a minus c, this a minus this c, that's a positive number. This b minus the c, that's also a positive number because a is greater than c and b is greater than c. So when you subtract those two things, this a from this, or this c from this a and this c from this b, those produce two positive numbers that we're then adding together. So a positive number plus a positive number is a positive number, which means this is a positive number, not zero, which means we can divide by it. So we're safe to divide by this because we know that this is not equal to zero. And once we divide by it, then we get our solution. So sigma up is equal to B minus C 
divided by a plus b minus 2c. All right, so that is more or less done. The one issue, though, goes back to what we learned in the last lesson, that we need to make sure that this is actually a valid mixed strategy. And the way we do that is we have to ensure that the mixture is between 0 and 1. And the three necessary and sufficient conditions to ensure that this mixture is between 0 and 1 is that the denominator is not equal to 0. If the denominator is equal to 0, then you're dividing by 0 and you can't do that, right? So that can't be the case. It must be the case that the denominator and the numerator are both positive or they're both negative or the numerator is equal to 0. If the numerator is equal to 0, then your fraction is equal to 0 and that means you have a number between 0 and 1, so that's fine. The reason that the numerator and the denominator either both have to be positive or both have to be negative is that you need the number overall to be positive. You need to be between 0 and 1 and not between negative 1 and 0. And so if you divide a negative number by a positive number or a positive number by a negative number, the result of that is a negative number, which means that this is a violation. Whereas if both are positive, if you divide a positive number from a positive number, you get a positive number. And if you divide a negative number by a negative number, then those negatives cancel out and you get a positive number. So that's what that is doing there. And then the third step is to make sure that the magnitude of the denominator is greater than the magnitude of the numerator. That's essentially saying that what you're dividing by has to be more than what is on top. And the reason for that is that's what ensures that you have a percentage rather than having a number that's greater than one. So let's test this. We have this mixed strategy right here, and we need to test to make sure that all three of these necessary and sufficient conditions are followed in order to make sure that we have a valid mixed strategy. So the first thing that we need to check, we need to make sure is the denominator is not equal to zero. Well, this is the denominator here. And remember, when we divided by this originally, we had to show that this was not equal to zero. And we showed that this was, in fact, greater than zero. So this was fine. So the denominator is not equal to zero. So step one is clear. Step two is to show that the numerator and the denominator are both positive or they're both negative or the numerator is equal to zero. So the numerator, b minus c, that's positive. Remember that b is greater than c, so b minus c is greater than zero. So the numerator is not equal to zero, and it is positive, so that means to follow this part that the numerator and denominator are both positive or both negative. Well, the numerator is positive, so that means we need to make sure that the denominator is positive as well. And again, that's something that we've already seen before. We know that a plus b minus 2c is uh, a plus b minus 2c is greater than 0, so that means when you divide b minus c from a plus b minus 2c, when you essentially do this, you get a positive result. So step 2 is clear, and so all we have to do is make sure that condition 3 is going to hold as well, and we're fine. So the magnitude of the denominator has to be greater than the magnitude of the numerator. So these are positive numbers, so it's all we have to do here is show that a plus b minus 2c is greater than b minus c. So the denominator here is greater than the numerator. And if you work through this, then you just get to a is greater than c. And that holds because a is greater than b is greater than c. So a has to be greater than c. And so that takes care of that. And so this mixed strategy that we had before, that sigma up is equal to b minus c over a plus b minus 2c, that holds which means we have a valid mixed strategy Nash equilibrium here, or rather a valid mixed strategy for player one in the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. To actually solve for the complete mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, we essentially have to do the same process for player two's mixture, but I'm not going to do that here. We're already running a little bit long, but that's something that you can do on your own. It's exactly the same steps that we just did just in reverse now. Instead of doing it for player one, we're going to be doing it for player two. And then once we derive that mixed strategy for player two, we need to make sure that the mixture is in fact between zero and one by checking these three necessary and sufficient conditions. So that is the steps that you need to do. As I said, in section 3.2 of Game Theory 101, the complete textbook, I go through a ton of examples of this. I'll cover it for player two, and I'll also cover it for different games, like including the Prisoner's Dilemma, and show how things can go wrong, which is the case in, in the Prisoner's Dilemma. But that's the idea of how to solve for mixed strategies in these generalized games. Now, the reason that we're interested in doing these sorts of things is because once we have games in a generalized form, like this right here, we can see how changing these payoffs by making B a little bit larger or a little bit smaller will affect how the players play the game, which is really interesting and a, a really useful thing to be doing in game theory. And we'll actually get to that not in the next video, but the video after. In the next video, we're going to talk about one other minor thing 
thing that can pop up when we have these sorts of variables and how to handle that. It's going to be something called knife edge equilibria. It's an interesting topic and we will take care of it in the next video. Join me then.